Ja, wenn die Zeiten härter werden, wenn die ganzen Strukturen ein bisschen rigoroser werden, dann habe ich das dringende Bedürfnis, mit CJ Hopkins zu sprechen. Letztes Mal war es im April, es ist August, es hat sich einiges getan, vielleicht nicht unbedingt zum Besseren, aber wir werden darüber sprechen, auf welchem Weg wir gerade sind, CJ Hopkins. Dramatiker, Satiriker, lebt in Berlin, kommt aus den USA. Wir werden das Interview wir wieder äh, auf Englisch führen und für euch auch diesmal wieder Untertitel auf Deutsch hier in den YouTube-Einstellungen. Äh, CJ, good to have you here. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me back. Last time we spoke, uh, it was afterwards our video got deleted um, on YouTube. Uh, because you said something which you are not allowed to say on YouTube about masks and so on. And I thought to make things easier, maybe uh, you would like to begin with everything you always wanted to say, which may become uh, or which already is forbidden on YouTube or which may be censored. So we can make uh, edit out it later and to have a PG version. And uh, so you, everything you always wanted to say, which may be censored. I don't know really what to say anymore. Um, I haven't been focusing on, uh, you know, all of the the censorable uh, you mm. know, details as much uh, recently. And frankly, the censorship has uh, become so crazy. Um, the latest thing that I posted on uh, it was Facebook or Twitter, um, but it, uh, Facebook is the one that. Uh, that censored it. Um, apparently, I'm not allowed to refer to Estonia as Estonia. <laughs> <laughs> not PC anymore. I don't know. Someone had asked me, this was, I, I, this was just a reply that I made in a Facebook mm. post. Someone asked me, you know, what is the context of this picture? It was a picture of uh, people uh, in the central square in a town in Estonia. Um, where they're segregating the unvaccinated, mm -hmm. you know, from the vaccinated. They have these uh, old town days, you know, it's one of the typical European uh, festivals, summer festivals, mm -hmm. where, you know, there's street theater and, and music and, uh, you know, stalls where people sell things. Um, and so what they did in the, in the town square is they erected fences, big medical, uh, not medical, metal fences. Mm -hmm. Uh, everywhere too, and the the unvaccinated in the picture were all standing behind the fences, you know, while the vaccinated people were enjoying the old town days. Anyway, someone on Facebook asked me, "What is the context of this picture?" And I said, uh, uh, "You know, it's uh, this, you know, uh, 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 fair in in Estonia." And so Facebook deleted that and sent me a notice, you know, um, uh, indicating that. Um, I was uh, spreading, um, I, I don't know what it was, uh, uh, false advertising uh, or fraud um, or something else nefarious. I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> Regarding this whole censorship by the big tech uh, corporations, there's a lot of confusion uh, going on. You, you don't know, as you said, which are the rules now uh, that I have to, to live by and to obey. Do you think this, this confusion and to, to make it um, to, to make it uneasy for for the people not not to to know how to what to say uh, what is allowed to say is there's a ten intention behind this? I, I, I do. I, I in fact I, I mentioned it um, to somebody that I was uh, talking to on Facebook. Um, I, I posted about you know this censorship mm. and mm. you know I thought it was funny mm. you know that they uh, censored my reference to Estonia, and uh, the person wrote back and said. Uh, oh, no, 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 they weren't censoring you because of Estonia. You know, they censor all Twitter links. So if you put a Twitter link in, they censor you automatically. Um, and then I put another Twitter link in, said, well, that Twitter link, mm -hmm. you know, seems to work just fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they're not censoring that one. Um, but the point is, every time I post something about censorship, and I always do, whenever I get a notice from Twitter or a notice from Facebook, whenever I post that, I get replies from people Uh, explaining to me, oh no, 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 CJ, you're not, you're not being censored. It's just they have an algorithm that checks for this word and thing. And, mm -hmm. and, and the reason that I post every time I get censored is I have this feeling that, that, that we are becoming conditioned. We're becoming accustomed mm -hmm. to this corporate censorship. And that people are starting to think, you know, well, it's, it's our responsibility mm -hmm. 
to you know to learn how they set was censor us and and why, uh, what they're censoring and so we should change our behavior to you know to conform to whatever censorship you know it's like if you have a you know if like if the toilet doesn't work quite right and you have to you know jiggle the handle a little mm -hmm, bit mm -hmm. you know if someone comes to your house and you tell them oh yeah you've got to jiggle it a little bit mm -hmm. right and that that's the messages that i'm getting from people as if as if it as if it were normal mm. yeah. <laughs> for us to have to stop and think, wait, will they censor me if I write this word or that sentence? And to justify it as, yeah. as well. And may we also become accustomed to uh, being censored for things and, and for speech that may incite uh, harmful behavior uh, by, by others. So the thing you said, uh, what you said about the masks, the justification is, okay, it, it may lead others to engage in harmful behavior. And so this may be a principle which can be v very broadly uh, uh, applied. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. it's, 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 it's crazy, you know, it, it, it is crazy. You know, first of all, you know, I'm, I'm no one in a position of authority. You know, I'm not issuing, you know, advice. I'm not issuing instructions uh, to the public. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm an author expressing an opinion, you know, uh, during an interview. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the idea, the idea that, that, you know, me, me saying, you know, you know um, and I'll say it again. <laughs> <laughs> there are, you know, it's crazy that it, it, it's crazy to me that people are still having this argument. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, the you know all the all the all the facts are there for pe for people to see. But the idea that that me, you know, saying this is is somehow you know, harmful and is going to damage or injure people, mm -hmm. you know, in society. It's, it's madness. It's insanity. Mm. Did you become more careful about what you say and how you say it? Or is, is it uh, rather triggering your aggression or re re rebellious character? It, it exactly, the latter, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's uh, on the contrary, you know, I have I think uh, just become more and more aggressive, uh, you know, with my posts. I mean, part of, uh, and with my columns, and you know, part of part of what I think is necessary right now is confrontation. We talked about this last time, and uh, the urgency has just increased for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we're at a point where where this type of confrontation is absolutely necessary. And I'll give you an example of what I mean um, when. Uh, it was the last few months, really, that the that the segregation system has really been rolled out um, in different countries, in you know, in in France, in in the United States, in New York, and and uh, in Italy, and um, and in Estonia. Um, <laughs> you know, as the segregation system was rolled out, a lot of my audience are you know Americans, and 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 so I gear a lot of my messaging to them. I started posting pictures of the old segregationists, you know, uh, from the American South in the 1950s and the 1960s from the Civil Rights Movement. And the point of that was to hold a mirror up to them and, and, and say, this is what you look like to a lot of us. Mm. You know, you're supporting segregation. You're telling yourself a story about it. You have a narrative about it that justifies it, right? But this as is they it, did as well. Yeah, this is what it looks like yeah. to us. You're segregating people who won't conform to your ideological beliefs. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. That kind of confrontation, I think, is absolutely essential now, mm -hmm. okay. uh, because I mainly because I think it's it's virtually impossible to get through to people anymore, mm -hmm. people who believe the official COVID narrative. I think it's, it's virtually impossible to get through to them with facts mm -hmm. and reason mm -hmm. and common sense. Um, um, and so I think, I think this type of confrontation is one way to maybe shake people out of, out of the trance for a moment even, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. for a moment. Yeah. But when they see you being angry, um, won't they say, oh, he's just an old white man 
and he is he has a ressentiment and uh, there maybe it's a personal thing and uh, he's exaggerating mm, this yes, and they do and they do mm -hmm. um, what I'm let me talk a little bit more about this because this is really what I'm focused on. If you if you go back, I believe that that what I'm doing, the kind of confrontation that I'm talking about, is is essentially uh, a, a form of classic nonviolent civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. If you go back to the civil rights movement in the United States, and you ask how did those activists change the minds of the general public at that time. Because in the 1950s, before the civil rights movement geared up, the American South was segregated, and most of the North wasn't, right? But the North wasn't really concerned. They were just going on with their life, and when they went down to Florida, you know, for their holidays, it was segregated. Mm -hmm. You know, when they went to New Orleans, you know, for their holidays, it was segregated. They were living with segregation. They were tolerating it. How did the activists change those minds and bring you know, American culture and society to a point where the majority of the country no longer supported segregation and was demanding that it change. They did it with lunch counter protests and school protests and marches. And what they did is they used nonviolent civil disobedience, right? And forced the authorities, the racist authorities in the South, to beat the hell out of them and come in and pour you know, drinks on them at the lunch counters and abuse them and basically display their hatred mm -hmm. and display their ugliness, mm -hmm. right? And they filmed it. And they showed America the pictures, said, look what you're supporting. <laughs> This is what you're supporting. <laughs> This is what you're allowing to happen. It did not change overnight. Mm -hmm. This, the, these activists worked for years, you know, for the better part of a decade. They worked, and it was step by step by step by step. And in the beginning, people said, you know, oh, you know, why, why are you doing it? What are you, yeah. And after years and years and years of showing people those pictures and persisting, things started to shift. But when you show people these pictures, um, nowadays they exist as well, um, people getting, getting round up at uh, demonstrations. Or these uh, pictures that you shared on, on Facebook, I think, uh, of this uh, uh, tower in Düsseldorf where mm. it said uh, Impfen gleich uh, Freiheit, where everyone who's, who, has a <laughs> who has been in school must think about the, the Auschwitz, uh, um, what, what uh, is on, on the gates of Auschwitz, what was there. If you show it to them, I, I always think, okay, now they will wake up because it, it's so very obvious to them, but it is not. No, no. It's gonna, I think what we're, I don't think, I don't think it's a question of, of now they will wake up. I don't think that people are going to wake up. It's, I think at this point, yeah. the, the, it's the majority, definitely. Uh, the people who have swallowed the official COVID narrative, yeah, and are just, they're embedded in it. It's, I, I've described this, we talked about this last time, and, and you did a great job with uh, uh, one of my pieces. It's kind of similar to a cult, you know, to people, to uh, people who have been indoctrinated into a cult. Um, if you, if you look at totalitarianism and you look at totalitarian systems. What they are really is just a, an incredibly large version of a cult, right? When, when people are in a cult, you, you can't get them out by showing them something that wakes them up or showing them the truth because it, they're there not really because they're deceived, Right? They're there because they've become a part of a social body, a social unit, right? And their motivation is to remain in good standing with everybody else in the social unit. You know, the, the, the horrible thing would be to be, you know, expelled, you know, from the cult or to have the cult leaders, you know, disapprove of them, you know, and say something. So their motivations are, are, 
are based on that. Right? That's the pressure that is being applied to them constantly. Um, you can, uh, I was just uh, talking about it with uh, someone today who is, uh, you know, somebody that I know in New York, you know, is a brilliant artist and a professor. And he was saying, I'm going to lose my job. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to get fired from my university position. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to lose my job. Um, I already can't, you know, go into a restaurant or any public mm -hmm. building. Um, all of this because he won't conform to the new mm -hmm. official ideology. Mm -hmm. It's real existential pressure that is being applied mm -hmm. by the system, by the cult, right, mm -hmm. on these people. Right? In his case, it was conscious. Uh, in, in most cases, it's not even conscious. Oh, absolutely. I, I, another, an, a, another person that I know is a musician in New York City um, who has been opposed, who has, you know, been criticizing the official narrative from the beginning, has been opposed to, you know, forced and coerced vaccinations from the very beginning, and she got vaccinated. Right. Why? Because she couldn't play. She couldn't work. She couldn't pay her bills. <laughs> she couldn't pay her rent. She couldn't play her music, which is what keeps her alive. Mm. Her life had become, you know, just, you know, sitting in front of a computer, mm -hmm you know, waiting to be evicted from her apartment. Mm -hmm. You know, she's very clear okay. about why she did it. You know, someone put a gun to her head and said, do it or else, and, and, and she did it. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of pressure that's being applied to people just like in a cult, mm -hmm. right? Just mm -hmm. like in a cult. Mm -hmm. The confrontation that I'm talking about, the, the goal of it, whether you're talking about nonviolent civil disobedience or, or what I'm talking about in this case, the goal of it is not to show people the truth or, you know, or, or disabuse them of some illusion that they have. The goal is to apply pressure from the other side. Mm -hmm. right? The goal is to apply the pressure by showing them the mirror because mm -hmm. I believe most of these people, most of these people are decent people with good hearts mm -hmm. yeah with good hearts I don't believe that the you know the vast majority of humanity are a bunch mm -hmm. of sadistic monsters mm -hmm. they have been swept up into this movement yeah. what I'm talking about is applying pressure from the other side holding up the mirror and saying look at the monster that you have become mm -hmm. look at the monster that you have become and the people who still have a conscience, the people with good hearts, it may not work the first time, it may not work the second time, it may not work the 72nd time, but eventually, if you keep showing them the picture, they don't want to be that monster. And it's about putting them in a place where, okay, you have to you know, incur the disapproval and the punishment of the cult leaders, Right? Or you have to recognize I am that monster and embrace it. It's about putting them in a, in a vice and forcing them to choose. But the cult leaders, they have very powerful means to lead people into their cult. And, um, and obviously, in most cases, it's not a conscious thing that's going on. So, for example, the masks or everything else in this regime is like an obedient experiment, which they are taking part in, but uh, they don't know, like in the Milgram experiment. So what can we put, put against, as a, as a pressure, against this very sadistic, yeah, sadistic and, and, and powerful methods? Mm -hmm. Very small things. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I believe that, well, let me start with that, and, and there's other things that we can do. Uh, but first of all, I believe that every little act, every little thing that we do, every decision that we make, every act, every statement that we make, every action that we take communicates something. Mm -hmm. You know, just like you just mentioned, the, you know, the theater of the... And uh, we're, we're going to get censored in the middle of your interview. Anyways. <laughs> What? Look at the ma look at the 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 magic. Look at the power of what was done with masks. You know, just the sheer power of this. 
you know, you know, yes, it, everyone has known for hundreds of years, you know, for I don't know how long, for a hundred years, for a long, long time, you know, that these, you know, it's ridiculous. But simply by ordering everyone to wear these masks and to walk around dressed up like, you know, we're in the infectious disease ward of a hospital, mm -hmm. suddenly that's where we were. That's, it's still where we are, mm -hmm. yeah? Um, if you, if you, it's theater. That's where I come from, it's from the theater. If you pretend <laughs> that you're living in the middle of a, you know, of a hospital, mm -hmm for 12 months, 17 months, you know, that's where you're living. That becomes the reality, mm -hmm. you know, just the, the, the power of that. We don't have that power. We can't order, you know, uh, you know, 70 million people, you know, to walk around wearing hospital masks. You know, this is, this is what we've got. There's, oh, it's upside down. There's written something on it. Uh, a hidden oh, message. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. That's what I. This is what I wear when I go grocery shopping. <laughs> Do you get reactions? Yes. Yes. Okay. I have to. You have to. I have to have a mask on. I can't have food. Mm -hmm. Right. I went through this. I think we talked about it last mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and early on, I had a big confrontation mm -hmm. with the police. Mm -hmm. You know, or because I had a paper bag masks, yeah. So I have to wear a mask to buy food, you know, to live. So this is what I do. You know, when I wear a mask, it has a protest message on it, or it has something like this on it. My old mask used to say, uh, "Befehl is Befehl," <laughs> right? and I absolutely get uh, uh, reactions. It's uh, it, basically every time that I go grocery shopping, it's like going to war. Mm -hmm. Right, because I can feel the hostility. Mm -hmm. You know, some people, you know, stare at me, and sometimes it's, you know, it's just the feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, and the uh, the the checkout people, the people that check out, they look up and they see it, and they start throwing my groceries aggressively. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh -huh. How do you feel when you see these reactions? Do do you want to incite these reactions? Yes. Yes, because what I want to do, what, what, what the system, what the machine wants to do, you know, is, is condition us to treat all of this as if it were normal, mm -hmm. right? To just, you know, naturally put our masks on. Mm -hmm. and of course, it's normal to, yeah. you know, put a ma medical mask on when we go in to do our shopping, mm -hmm. you know. Um, hello. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, the, the system wants to normalize all of this, mm -hmm. right? And what I'm trying to do, little steps, that's all it is. Mm -hmm. It's a, you know, it's, a, it's a, an essay that I write. It's a Facebook post. It's a tweet mm -hmm. on Twitter. It's a protest message on my mask. Mm -hmm. It's when I got in the taxi to come over here and I told the taxi driver, you know, du musst für mich diese Maske nicht tragen. You don't have to wear this mm -hmm. mask for me. And he said, no, it's okay, and kept it on anyway. But I believe I have to have faith mm. that these little moments, you know, these little moments, they add up, mm. right? Every day, well, not every day anymore because I don't like to go to the store every day anymore, but several times a week, I go into the same grocery store with my protest mask. Mm -hmm. And they have to see it, and it makes them angry, and I have to believe that these little acts, these little acts are maybe chipping away at the simulation, as, at, at the spell mm. that people are under. So you still, I feel, in you have hope still, because some people which have been resistant and which were very critical, now they say, okay, the game is over, it's not my duty to save humanity, and they are too powerful, and my energy is better when I put it in, maybe in a productive way, or even if I, if I retire and, and go my everyday life, uh, lead my everyday life, but you still have this hope that the, all these little steps can add up to something which changes the situation. I'll tell you the truth. I don't know if it's hope, um, but I just I 
don't know how to stop. I don't know, uh, you know, I, I don't know what I would do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's if, if someone is attacking you, you know, you fight back. Mm -hmm. Um, you fight back, and then, and that's what this is to me. This is an attack on society. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, look at what has been done to society over the past, you know, 16, 17, 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, it's an attack. Mm -hmm. And to me, it doesn't really matter whether I can win or not. You know, it, it, There's it, no choice for it, you. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. If someone is attacking me, okay, maybe he's going to kill me. Because maybe he's stronger than, than, than me, he has better weapons than I have. Mm -hmm. um, but, but maybe if I obey, he, he leaves me alone. This is just not an option. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, I, I, you know you're, you, what you're talking about is, you know, maybe, maybe if I just, you know, become his slave, mm -hmm. you know, then he won't kill me. You know, and, and, you know, to me, when I become his slave, I'm dead already. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm worse than dead. Mm -hmm. You are um, calling this system a machine, the machine. Yeah. What is behind this, uh, this word of uh, this? What, what do you understand by a machine? I'm trying to understand it and, uh, um, um, okay, you've asked, so I will get into it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it goes all the way back to you know, 1989, 1990, the early 90s. Um, what happened? You know, uh, we're talking about you know, uh, I know all of my work basically. You know, it, 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 my, I wrote my first uh, play, my first uh, you know, produced play um, in the early '90s, '91 and '92, and I wrote it because after the Soviet Union collapsed, I said, "Okay, we are we are entering a new world. Um, uh, uh, we're entering a." a a configuration of power that has never ever existed before, um, where one ideological system dominates the entire planet. Right when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, basically, you know, uh, uh, Marxist socialist ideology it just dissolved. You know, and I come from the left. You know, so I've, you know, I, you know, like yeah, socialism, but it dissolved, <laughs> it disappeared, and you know, we entered a a global capitalist world. And what I've been tracking for the last 30 years, whether in my plays or my books or you know, in my columns now, um, is, the, is the evolution, the development of global capitalism having become a global hegemon, right? Uh, if you look back in history, you know, many empires have aspi aspired to global domination, but the, the, the means, the technology, the, the power, the tools to actually do it have not existed until now, right? And that's where we are. I, I, this is what I believe. I believe we're in a new world and that most of us can't really see it yet. Um, I think most of us still interpret the world as a collection of competing sovereign nation states, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and of course there are competing sovereign mm -hmm. nation states, there are competing corporations too. Mm -hmm. But ideologically, the world is one, mm -hmm. right? There's one value system. And so I've been tracking the evolution of this machine, global capitalism, yeah, over the last 30 years. And what have, I, what have I seen? Well, okay, so the Soviet Union fell apart and global capitalism realized, okay, well, I, I control the, the entire world, right? Uh, what is there to do? There aren't any other enemies out there to fight because I'm everywhere, right? But I'll look around inside and see, oh, there's some, there's some territory over here that is still structured according to the values of that ideological system that I, you know, that just disappeared. Let me go in there and destabilize and restructure that place. You know, we're talking about Eastern Europe, you know. And then, oh, no, we've got some more blockage over here in the Middle East. We've got people who are actually trying to, you know, run their societies based on their religious values. And we can't have that. You know, in global capitalism, let's go in there and it will destabilize and restructure that whole place. And then right around 2016, 
an interesting thing happened. It was started, it started earlier than that, but that's when it really bubbled up in the West, in Europe and in the UK with Brexit, and then in the United States with Trump. There, there was this populist uprising, this populist resistance to what? to the hegemony of global capitalism, right? And so global capitalism went apeshit, right? It's, it's suddenly, oh my God, it's the second coming of Hitler <laughs> and he's a Russian spy and, you know, and they went, they went absolutely nuts for four years to crush this populist rebellion. It culminated in, what was it last year when uh, the election and, and, uh, and Trump uh, uh, lost or, or was deposed mm. and you know and then they had the big celebration in Washington DC when Biden was inaugurated and no people were allowed to attend because the entire city of Washington DC the capital was occupied by the military and there were fences surrounding all the government buildings Right, and they even did a little Lichtdom thing. That's <laughs> just a little joke on my part, but they did. It, it was, it's, I had been writing about this for four years. I had been writing, this is where we're going, this is what it's leading to, and this was the big celebration. Oh, democracy has been restored, you know, finally, yeah. But this resistance is still out there, right? What happened next, right? What happened next? Uh-oh. Uh oh, apocalyptic virus, mm -hmm. all right? There's an apocalyptic virus. It looks like, you know, the only choice we have because of this, you know, coronavirus, right? And let's remind everybody that coronaviruses have been around forever. The common cold is a coronavirus, mm -hmm. but there's a new coronavirus, right? Mm -hmm. So the only choice that we have, all right, is to transform the entire world into a totalitarian <laughs> dystopia, you know, and segregate, you know, political opponents and, and you know, roll out the, the goon squads, you know, and basically shift, shift the global capitalist culture that we were in to a much more openly totalitarian form, mm. all right? The way, the way I see it is, you know, Globo Cap, as I call them, yeah, for whatever reason, has decided, you know, A, it can, and B, it needs to do away with the, the simulation of democracy mm -hmm. and move to a much more openly totalitarian mm -hmm. structure. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. And the magic virus you know, was the perfect way mm. to manage this. But usually these terms are opponents. Capitalism needs free markets, free trade, and totalitarianism is a closing of the society. So how do they match? When, we, when I say totalitarianism, people think of you know, Nazi Germany, mm. or the USSR, North Korea. North Korea, what have you. Um, uh, this is not national totalitarianism. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a new form of totalitarianism, and I don't claim to understand it and be able to you know, explain it to everybody perfectly. I, I'm, that's what I'm working on, mm -hmm. trying to understand it. It's not national totalitarianism. This is global. This is global, right? Well, it, I just got finished with a bunch of talks with you know, Catherine Austin Fitz, a very uh, uh, smart and interesting lady talking about all of this. And one of the questions that I asked her, you know, was because she was talking about, you know, the intentions of the people that are driving this. And, and I disagreed with her about that. And I said, you know, I don't see it as, as a bunch of, yes, I believe that the people at the top, you know, they believe that they're in charge. They believe they have a plan. They believe they have a goal. They believe that their plan is a good one, that they have a good will? For them, yes. You know, and, and, and uh, the, the way, and, and, and if Catherine is listening, I apologize if I'm butchering your mm -hmm. explanation, forgive me. Um, she kind of sees uh, a, a future or a planned future, right? Where there is this small elite 
right? And who are enjoying the good life, basically, you know, and have many privileges and what have you. And then the vast majority of humanity is more or less living on, you know, um, uh, uh, universal basic income. Um, we are all, you know, monitored either, you know, with our phones, our devices, and and what have you. A social credit system. A social credit system. There is, a, you know, a central bank currency. There's, you know, cash is gone. Um, so that, you know, the elite, basically any time that you do anything that they don't want done, they can just shut off your money, right, and, and just shut you off. Um, that's, it's the kind of dystopian vision that she was seeing. And, and, and I, I asked her, you know, how, you know, how would that function, you know, in the market? What would, you know, who would buy all the stuff? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. how would the, the markets work? You know, and I, because I couldn't see it, it and it's your question, is, yeah. you know, isn't it contradictory? Yeah. Um, it probably is, uh, because I don't believe that those guys and gals, right, are actually in charge. Uh, I, I think they think they are, you know, but I don't think they are. I think that they're part of a machine that is moving inexorably forward in a direction. Mm -hmm. And they are operating the machine, mm -hmm. but they're not directing the machine. No one is? Or is, is there someone behind the curtain? I think the machine is driving itself, mm -hmm. which is, to me, the scariest scenario. Mm -hmm. And you uh, can stop it then? Well, maybe we can, but... You know, if, 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 it's, if it's a question of this guy is driving the machine and he's a bad guy, mm. well, then that's easy. We can get him out of there mm -hmm. and put a good guy in there. But if the machine is driving it, you know, you can go in and remove all the guys that are operating it, and they're just replaced with other guys that will continue to operate it because the machine demands that those roles will be filled. If I don't think I answered your question, um, the, 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 I don't think that there is a logical, functional vision at the end of this mm -hmm. trajectory. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the machine is driving and it doesn't know where it's going. Because it's just a machine, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Machines don't know where they're going. They're perf it's performing its function, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's performing its function. So we either have the possibility to destroy the machine, or to find a place where this machine has no power. Is is there are these possibilities for you realistic scenarios? They have to be. I mean, I, you know, I, I honestly don't know how to answer that. I don't know, you know, you asked me about hope before, mm -hmm. and, you know, I don't, I don't know if I have a lot of hope. I think I have some kind of crazy faith. You know, I'm not a, a, mm -hmm. a religious person, and, you know, no organized religion, but, but I do have some kind of crazy faith. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that the machine wins. You know, I don't think, I don't think it wins. You know, I think we win, and and I don't know if we win in in my lifetime, and you know, 20 years, and 40 years, and 50 years. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that we're in for a long struggle. Mm -hmm. Is one way to to win against the machine and to 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 fight this fight to accept this kind of segregation which is put upon us and maybe to see some advantages in this and to, to say, okay, then if you want a society of vaccinated and, and uh, people who are in a social credit system and you leave us alone and you, you, you want us to be out there, then we make up our, uh, we, we build up our own society and maybe this will get some sand into the machine. No. <laughs> Ultimately, no. Um, I think um, I think in the short run, you know. I think in the short run. I mean, you know, th this is no surprise to anybody. You know, every other person that I know, 
you know, is talking about where, where can I get away to? Where can we, where can we escape to? You know, I mean, you know, a lot of, in the United States, a lot of people left uh, the Northeast and uh, California and moved to Florida, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> because Florida was acting, you know, like Sweden mostly. Yeah. Um, uh, and the natural impulse is, you know, oh my God, the society is turning into a dystopia. Well, let me get out. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, my wife and I, you know, joke about it all the time. You know, we're saying, okay, where are we gonna, you know, have the Unabomber cabin? I don't know if you remember the yes. Unabomber, you know, yeah. just a little cabin in the woods, not connected you, to anything. You just want the cabin, not the methods you use. Not right? the methods, okay. no. Don't want to bomb Just for the record. But I think it's a, it's a natural impulse to want to get out, get away. If you're like, I cannot fight this thing, it's too big. Yeah, you know, too big, too powerful. I want to get out, I want to get away, and we'll just set up our own world over here. Yeah. And in the short term, I think that is actually really useful and really good because I think we are going to need these outposts. Mm. <laughs> I fear that we're going to need these outposts, mm. places where, where people who are not part of the machine, people who are opposing it, can come together, can gather, and uh-huh. to be outside of it and connect with each other. I think that these, these are important in the short term. I don't think they are a long-term solution. Mm. At the point when any of these outposts become powerful enough to register on the radar, right? They won't be left alone. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, I, I, there are numerous examples in the United States. You know, mm-hmm. Waco and Ruby Ridge and what have you. When, when these alternative, you know, societies become large mm-hmm. enough to mm-hmm. get notice, mm-hmm. the authorities come and destroy them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have to keep in mind that that as useful as these outposts can be, we're setting up outposts within mm-hmm. a system. Mm-hmm. They're not outside of the system; mm. they're inside of it. Mm. But it is key. It is crucial to remain below the radar. Okay. This is. If you look at going back to what I was talking about with global capitalism, that is the state of the world. Mm. You know, when I say it's one big global capitalist mm. world, it, that does not mean every inch, every meter mm. of this world is dominated. No, there are pockets of resistance all over, yeah. Yeah. all over. Yeah. But they are islands of resistance mm. within this larger system. Mm. If if we want to use them. And 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 have them as you know sanctuary, a safe yeah. harbor. You know, yes, staying below the radar is a good idea. Mm. Okay, maybe this is the way we have to go in in, in the short term. As uh, and maybe we, with our interview, we uh, made something to have more islands and to to. Um, uh, to have people to, to get the idea out there to have to build up these islands of of uh, sanity mm. <laughs> thank you cj for for our talk thanks it was a pleasure talking with you again das war's für heute bei kaiser tv ich hoffe es hat euch gefallen bis zum nächsten mal macht's gut <lacht> Oh, <laughs>